What's going on guys? It's the Ancient Greek here, and today I'm going to be talking about how Theban hegemony basically precipitated and encouraged and helped in many ways the rise of Macedon and Philip II, father of Alexander the Great, who we all know. So this right here is basically what Greece looked like at the time when Philip II was first starting to rise. Macedon was like this, having just seized the Athenian settlement of Amphipolis up here from Athens after having declared war on them. Athens is getting really nervous at this point, but the Thessalian League here still exists under Jason of Phrae who is the most well-known leader of the League, but he's eventually tricked and killed, and the League is thrown into chaos and left at the mercy of Philip, who proceeds down to take control of this League. Thebes is the hegemon of Greece still, but they're starting to come under threat from and starting to be nervous, just like Athens, about the growing power of Macedon. Thebes controls Euboea, formerly an Athenian possession, this island over here, and Boeotia, of course, the heartland of the Boeotian League, which Thebes rules. The Aetolians are the Aetolians, still the Aetolian League here, Achaean League here. Elis managed to get extra island out here and uh, managed to hold their land against forces like Spart the Spartans and Argos for a very long time through their manipulation of the diplomatic situation in the Peloponnese. Argos and Corinth tried to be united earlier before the rise of Thebes in the Corinthian War, and after they united into one country, the peace of Antic Anticlides that ended the Corinthian War and was actually established by the Persians basically ended their union and had Corinth and Argos be independent from each other again. Corinth is basically nothing compared to what it was before. They used to have land up here, they used to be in control of Kakaira, they used to be this is the Chalkis Pides Peninsula, by the way. And they used to have Ambrakia here and everything, and they just, like, got to the point where they now have just their city and the land surrounding it, and the Isthmus of Corinth, that is the passage passageway between the Peloponnese and the rest of Greece. So, Argos is back to just being Argos, being under control of Argos itself, and Mantinea, which is most of the entire area of Argolis, with the exception of Corinthos, and actually Milos in this game is considered to be part of the province as well, but you can see why they wanted to be unified, because they're part of the same province. Sparta is defeated by Thebes, and that is one of the biggest reasons, the first biggest reason I'm going to go through of why Macedon was allowed to become so powerful. Because Sparta used to be in control of basically all of Greece, I mean, at least, if not directly, indirectly. They were the hegemon of Greece after the Peloponnesian War, after Athens was defeated, they were the hegemon. And the peace after the Corinthian War, Sparta actually won many land engagements in the Corinthian War, although losing it at sea. They had, uh, they were favorited by Persia in that peace that happened after the Corinthian War that I discussed earlier. And they were allowed to keep, like, basically all of their hegemony, pretty much. And the thing is, 
Sparta was not interested. Sparta had plans to invade Persia in the future as well, but Sparta was not interested in leading any campaign to invade per Persia, having any campaign to invade Persia where they were not going to lead. So if there was going to be an invasion of Persia, Sparta wanted to be at the head of it. That was period. That was it. They believed that they were the saviors of Greece, and that goes all the way back to the Battle of the 300 at Thermopylae, which everybody who even thinks about ancient Greece, that's the first thing they think about. So, that was Sparta's position, and the fact that they were not interested in any campaign that they were not going to lead into Persia is why Macedon was kind of constricted by them. When Beatia, when the Beatian League rose in revolt against Sparta and won, and there's the Battle of Leuctra, which is one of the most famous battles in ancient Greek history where the Theban army actually defeats a Spartan army in battle, and believe it or not, the Spartan king himself dies in the fighting. And that is something that has basically never happened in the history of Sparta. They've never been defeated by an equal force on an even playing field before. I mean, yeah, Thermopylae was actually ultimately a loss, but that wasn't equal at all. The Persians were like hundreds of thousands, and the Greeks were just about 1,200. Some people say 1,200, some people say 7,000. The Greeks were much less, is the point. And that was a huge shock to everybody. Not just Sparta. Sparta, for sure, but everybody. And everybody basically saw that times were changing big time. Athens kind of just stood by on the sidelines during all of this. They didn't really do much when Thebes was making war, but Thebes even invaded all the way into the Peloponnese, and they thought about taking Sparta itself, but they ended up deciding to turn back and not do that when Erpeminondas died himself in battle. And I think even Pelopidas might have died as well. Pelopidas being the other great deity and commander who was always assisting Epaminondas in his campaign to make Thebes the hegemon of all of Greece, in which he did. And so now comes the time of Philip II, and Thebes is the hegemon of Greece. Now Philip II, when he was a kid, when he was younger, he was a hostage in Thebes, and he learned from Epaminondas all the tactics that he used to defeat the Spartans, and the tactics that he used to build his economy of Beatia, the Beatian League, into a powerhouse, and how he managed to become hegemon of Greece, and just, but it was mostly military reforms and military tactics and strategy, and from this Philip II learned about how to do the same and do even better ultimately in his own kingdom. And so he returned to Macedon with this knowledge and he created the Macedonian phalanx with the Sarissa and all of that stuff that we know Alexander used to the core when he invaded Persia. So Philip begins invading Greece, and at this point, Sparta is in no position to stop him at all. Nobody is in any position to stop him other than Thebes, and Thebes enlists the help of Athens, because Athens is also, as I said before, making war on uh, Macedon up in the north. And Beatia is basically at this alone. And that is another reason why Beatia allowed Philip to rise. So there's the reason of that 
Beatia displaced Sparta. There's the reason that Beatia basically taught Philip II. And there's also the reason that Beatia was at this, like, almost alone in a lot of ways. I mean, they didn't have, like, a united Greece, like what happened against the Persian Empire, where an army just came together. And the other thing that was going on was because Thebes taught Macedon all that stuff, and Macedon was kind of a Greek nation, Macedon was harder to beat than Persian soldiers. I mean, Persian soldiers wore basically just standard clothes and uh, carried just a shield and a spear into battle and or like a wicker shield or you know just armor made out of wicker or leather or whatever like their their uh, equipment wasn't really up to par as far as like being in competition with the Greeks goes Spartans had bronze shields, bronze armor, bronze helmets, bronze everywhere, you know, and it was very hard to penetrate Spartan soldiers, but at the time of Thermopylae, for example. But this is a totally different situation here because these guys fight not just like Greeks anymore, but now even better than Greeks, the Macedonians. And so Beatia is in a troublesome situation and they didn't realize that that child who was a hostage in their nation before would end up becoming their worst nightmare and once he conquered the Thessalian League that became pretty real now there is mention at the beginning of Philip's campaign as he goes down here into the Beatian League Beatian League he, there is mention of a battle by the river and a battle by a battle by the mountain or by the snow or something like that. There are mentions of these two battles where the Beatian League actually secures victory over. Uh, Macedon, and they actually successfully ambush his force and beat back his force and beat back his cavalry, and especially his cavalry in the battle by the river. And he loses a lot of cavalry. Philip II does. And Philip II is forced to, like, to cope with that situation. And it makes the Beatians and the Athenians very confident about the situation and it makes them feel like you know we are now actually going to be the victors of this war and it wasn't as bad as we thought and then the battle of Carinea comes now the battle of Carinea is no easy slog and the Beatians and the Athenians learned that the hard way because Philip II was highly organized. He arrayed his forces on the field in a gigantic wall of pikes against the hoplites' shorter spears, who couldn't even, were not even long enough to reach back behind the pikes to the soldiers who were carrying the pikes. Now, they did push them aside because the hoplite shields were actually bigger and they could like have all the pike points uh, jabbing their shield and just kind of push the pikes to their side to get back to the soldiers. So it was still a fierce fight, but the Athenians got too confident. They thought they were going to win when Philip started feigning his retreat on their side of the battlefield. And Philip, and it ended up being a complete ruse, and Philip ended up mown, mowing him down. Some say by his infantry who were fighting, the very infantry fighting the Athenians, and some say by the cavalry led by Alexander who ran into the gap between the Beatian half of the 
uh, allied line and the Athenian half in the allied line, which had formed. And the Boeotians made a tactical error allowing that to happen, because once there's a break between in a phalanx like that, where a break in the line opens because one half of it advances and the other stays back, then that becomes extremely vulnerable, and they should have seen it coming, especially considering, like, Alexander over there s sitting and waiting for the right time to pounce with his cavalry. Because cavalry can't pounce against a wall of spears and shields, but cavalry can pounce on the backside of a wall of spears and shields. So the Boeotians made that tactical error, lost the Battle of Karania, their sacred band was completely slaughtered, and Thebes, however, was spared for the time being, until they would revolt again once Alexander took power, and then they were completely burned to the ground and laid to waste, and they wouldn't be they wouldn't make any sort of comeback until Cassander, who was disgusted at the way Alexander treated his fellow Greeks while he gave the Persians he conquered all these different honors. And uh, he rebuilt Thebes and called back all the people who were in exile from the city and brought back the power of Thebes and the economic influence of Thebes for sure and the Boeotian League. But they never got back to what they were, and by then, the situation in the world at that time, in the East at least, was completely different, with Macedonians ruling all the land that used to be part of the Persian Empire. And so, that is how the Boeotian League basically allowed Macedon to rise and it was both like something that they were completely aware that they were doing and also some things that they weren't aware that they were doing that was actually giving Philip power and so we have they taught Philip the second they displaced Sparta who would never have been willing to allow never have been willing to teach anybody and never have been willing to allow uh, Macedon to rise in their stead at all. And they also made a tactical error at Karanea, and they were really at the fight with less allies than they could have had. They weren't at it alone completely, but they were at it with less allies that, than they could have had. And perhaps they could have done better with diplomacy with the other Greeks and having the other Greeks like them, especially in the Peloponnese, because they didn't receive any aid from the Peloponnese for the battle at all, almost. And so, that is the story of how the Boeotian League essentially allowed Macedon to conquer the rest of Greece, except Sparta. And the reason for the Spartans not being conquered is something that I will save for a totally different video, but alongside the Mithridatic Wars series that I'm going to have still being continued, with the first Mithridatic War being the next video, Along with that, I'm also going to be doing a series on the Boeotian League itself from the very beginning of when it started. Maybe I'll even go all the way back to the beginning of Thebes and the Mycenaean era and the Bronze Age and just trace their entire history all the way up through the time that I just described where they were defeated. And I'll go into more detail about the Battle of Karanea and the Battle of Leuctra and all those different exciting, incredible battles that happened in history, and I'll go into more detail about people like Epaminondinas and Pelopidas. And so, thank you so much for watching this video, 
If you love the content and you want to see more, please like and subscribe. It helps the channel a ton. And as always, stay safe and be the best, my Phil Hellenes. The Ancient Greek is out.